Ed, you're muted. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who it is for whom it is still afternoon, uh, welcome to the final panel session of the day. Um, uh, panel number three called Race at the Table. And uh, I will basically keep things short and uh, turn it over to um, our first panelist, uh, who is uh, Mark Hines from the University of Kentucky. Uh, I was just there actually, um, old, on old school racism, game mechanics and narrative as symbiotic elements in world building racial politics. Uh, so I will turn it over to the presenter. And uh, as people are presenting, of course, put your questions uh, in chat. Howdy, y'all. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And if y'all could please excuse the mess we got going on in the background. We're trying to refurbish our office at the moment. So we got ladders and paint just about everywhere, um, <laughs> as the eye can see. Uh, yeah, as was stated, uh, my name is Mark Hines. I'm a PhD candidate, formerly a master's candidate, um, and portions of this are excerpts, pieces from my master's thesis that I'm looking to work into something publishable uh, from the University of Kentucky. Um, the title, I guess, of this, <laughs> of this presentation is That's Just What the Book Says, which is so often, I think, DMs here as a, an excuse for the horrible things that can happen at the table, right, especially with regards to race and gender, which is a bit of what I'm going to talk about today. So main arguments that I'm talking about today is, uh, well, essentially, oftentimes the game worlds that we create and the narratives that we create and the mechanics that we create aren't necessarily architecture through some of which other pieces move, but rather that they are symbiotic, that they all work together to form a narrative fluency that players interact with and understand. And that's particularly true of the way that we interact with race at the table. I think in previous, uh, Previous talks today, a lot of folks have talked about the, the tropes, the understandings that players enter with when they are, uh, interact with race at the table, oftentimes because those races are analogs for the real world, whether that's Egypt or Viking cultures or so often like a pan-African culture that's treated with a racist treatment. Uh, oftentimes we interact all of those in a symbiotic or a co-constructive way is how I would best describe it, right? Uh, rather than describing game mechanics as uh, narrative architecture through which our narratives flow and through which we are able to encounter the game, I argue that all of these portions work together. Your world building, your game mechanics, your aesthetic choices, and the narrative itself, right? Uh, and especially in our evolving political media and internet landscape, um, I guess the other main argument I have is that a political neutrality is not a desirable or even achievable goal as such. I'll be talking about some particularly heinous members of the TTRPG community today, so I also want to take this moment to give kind of a content warning for what's going to be coming in certain parts of this presentation. Uh, but in addition, I'll also be talking about Wizards 2017 adventure, which is Tomb of Annihilation and features a lot of the problems that we'll be talking about today. The way that these mechanics can also interact with racist world building to serendipitously create an even more problematic narrative for your, for your players, right? A lot of the old school revival folks I'll be talking about are not necessarily the main community, uh, but rather they are a small but vocal minority who seek to bask in the lingering wake of Gamergate and our Trumpian political discourse here in the States, right? And they, the way that they frame their arguments and their discourse should be of interest to us as both scholars and game designers. Here are the two prongs of the fork of my argument as I'll be moving forward, right? Uh, and I also want to introduce some qualifiers before I do so. Like I said, not every member of the OSR is going to fit into my discussion. The old school renaissance is a vast movement of which only a small but vocal minority is openly fascist or openly Christian nationalist or openly racist and misogynistic. And much in the same way, I'm not representing D&D as without its own problems. I think most of us would agree that D&D is built upon a history of somewhat racist and sexist caricatures of monsters, of races, whatever. Uh, the other qualifier I have here is that mechanics, and this is an especially important point, can seem raced, even if they can occur in racial, especially when they occur in racially insensitive settings, but they can seem raced even when they're not. That's kind of what I want to talk about. 
today. And the driving questions for my work here are kind of at the bottom, the driving questions that drove my thesis. Why do folks who openly disdain by these game design principles also sometimes espouse fascist or Christian nationalist rhetoric, right? Uh, why do these folks congregate in similar circles? And how do the politics of gamer great discourse linger in the OSR, right? First, I want to briefly introduce what the OSR is, just for everybody. Um, and this is especially useful. I think most of us probably are more familiar with the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And so as opposed to the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, OSR games tend to be more of what people would describe as hardcore or gritty. They focus more on exploration and dungeons rather than the narratives, the role playing, the acting that we often associate with 5e gameplay, especially with things like critical role. Uh, rather than focusing on that narrative, on the acting, uh, players are more likely to metagame. It is very clear that players themselves are being challenged rather than the, the characters that they have created, right? I'm challenging you with these esoteric, unbalanced monster encounters or these puzzles that seem impossible to solve, right? Rather than expecting your character, I'm expecting you as a player to solve them, right? They can sometimes seem more contrived or artificial as a result. Like I was just saying, some mechanical examples of what you might see in a traditional OSR game are here. Uh, intentionally unbalanced gameplay, hex crawls, methodical exploration, where you have to keep track of your water, your food, your ammunition, things of that nature. Accumulating progress through experience points or treasures as opposed to milestones in a narrative. Overt metagaming, talking outside of character, and they tend to be more punishing as well. So, with those in mind, I want to transition to a member of the OSR. I have an example of a tweet interaction here from 2018 between Casimir Urbanski, also known as the RPG Pundit, and Jeremy Crawford, who is a leading designer and writer for the D&D team. This was taking place in the context of the United States imprisoning children alongside the border, um, the Trump administration separating children from their parents, right? A lot of members who align with Urbanski's belief, see the 5e team, see the Dungeons and Dragons team as overtly politicizing their gaming space, virtue signaling, right, and occasionally uh, attacking freedom of speech as well, things that we commonly see in the post-gamergate discourse, right? Uh, a lot of it is anti-women, anti-SJW, um, alongside gameplay critiques of 5e, right? It's important to separate the two though. Um, some examples of the content that they themselves produce, obviously content warning here. Uh, at the top there, I have what I think is a very indicative, important statement from the alt-right DM, who, as he is an alt-right DM who runs a blog, lose the game, lose the culture, lose the culture, lose Western civilization, strike a blow for Christendom, run any version of D&D published before 1989, right? Um, this the syllogism intentionally posits what early editions of D&D as being indicative of, quote, Western culture, unquote, or American culture or white male culture. Right. Um, a very interesting blog, if these things are interesting to you as well. Also, Fatal, which is kind of older than what I'm talking about, but of course is notorious for its over-reliance on rolling to alleviate players from any accountability for the misogynistic gameplay that they are liable to reproduce by playing a system like Fatal. Uh, other examples I have here, My Farag, Mark Vickerness, uh, open white supremacist, racist, anti-Semitic analogs um, in his gameplay. A lot of the races are thinly veiled attempts at him to engage in racist gameplay. James Desbro published the hashtag Gamergate card game and the infamous In Defense of Rape article. Uh, and then perhaps the new TSR Star Frontiers. This was leaked on Twitter. Uh, it looks accurate, but has yet to be verified by anybody, but it would just be another sort of piece in this group that I am tending to analyze. Problematic members of the OSR who are coupling their critiques of gameplay in commonly played Dungeons and Dragons games uh, alongside wanting to play more racist, misogynistic games as well. So why care, right? <laughs> why does this racist vocal minority minority of the OSR community uh, detest 5e. Why do they all work together? On the left here, I have a, an interesting quote from Wenger Satanis as part of one of his articles. 
uh, about Gen Con. Um, and you see the way that Satanus here is equating rhetorically all of these different things together, not just the gameplay, but also independent self-reliance America, compromise, moderation, business sense, economics, chain mail, bikinis, actual justice, or anything of value, right? They're all together in terms of his argument, right? Now, on the other side here, uh, I have a very helpful concept I'll be talking about today as well, which is semantic closure. I take this from Cord Whitaker, who is a medieval scholar, talking about how race and oftentimes our modern conceptions of race and fantastic was formed in medieval, right? Instead of having nuanced understandings of race as it exists as a social construct, semantic closure flattens those differences. So instead of seeing the nuance between different cultures, you can imagine someone's homeland. You can imagine how hot or cold it is. And from that, infer their history, culture, language, what they sound, what they look like. That's what happens when semantic closure occurs for white supremacists, right? That's what happens in Tomb of Annihilation, too. I'm also going to argue that's what happens in what I refer to as fantasy ethnospheres, right? Um, Wan Chuan and Whitaker also refer to these ethnospheres, right? A place where race, ethnicity, homeland, history, codependent and synonymous concepts, right? This tends to be a very common thing in a lot of fantasy games, very common in Tomb of Annihilation as well, especially common in those problematic OSR descriptions that I talked about, right? This is the problematic fantasy gameplay that can often interact with mechanics and produce especially problematic outcomes. Uh, I do want to speed up because I realize I have more to get through here. Uh, a lot of this is built upon aggrieved white fragility, white masculine politics, right? Uh, if they frame themselves as a tonally neutral, politically neutral sort of game sphere, or if they frame the OSR as the historical one, then any attack against that perceived or real becomes an attack against their own identity, right? And that's the way that they can combine defending their game traditions with defining Western culture, with defending masculine hegemony, things of that nature. All right. Keep all that box together, because now I'm going to shift gears very quickly to talking about Tomb of Annihilation, which represents a lot of those problems in a contemporary 5 campaign. Right. Wizards of the Coast also has a lot of the problems here. They have a history with misogyny and racism, of course. I'm talking about this adventure specifically because I read Tomb of Annihilation as OSR bait. It is very similar, right? It has a Sararak, the traditional Gary Gygax villain. It references Tomb of Horrors, one of the most infamous OSR friendly dungeons ever conceived by Gary Gygax, right? A lot of the most old, punishing, brutally punishing, without resurrection and without much healing, sorts of adventures we've ever seen from Wizards of the Coast. Many of the mechanics are similar. There are common adventure hooks and rewards. And again, the encounters that players are liable to encounter are unbalanced. They're inscrutable. They're obscure. They are difficult to parse. It encourages metagaming. And of course, Tomb of Annihilation has its own problems in world building, just as some of those earlier OSR examples, right? Cholt, where the majority of Tomb of Annihilation takes place, is an amalgam of prehistoric, colonial, and contemporary Africa, the Caribbean, South America, basically everywhere in the global South, whether it's contemporary or historic, right? Even, uh, unfortunately, DMs are encouraged to act in a characteristic accent using tongue clicks. And there's a lot of bad examples from here. Um, Basically what happens in Cholt is historical flattening, right? Because you are liable to encounter Cholt through the lens of a colonizer, you see what Mexican calls an imperial desire and cultural anxiety, right? You flatten the history, you flatten the cultures. That's what makes it possible to encounter dinosaurs, pirates, colonizing forces, animistic gods, lost cities, cannibalistic indigenous groups, mummies, zombies, or anything else, right, that we see in these depictions of other places as opposed to traditional high fantasy media, they all look the same. They all look the same despite taking inspiration and sources across thousands of years and across geographic countries on the other side of the planet from one another, 
right? This is an ethnosphere in another way. This is kind of the fantasy of a lot of white nationalists who enjoy playing these games for this reason. This is the fantasy that they enjoy as well. An ethnosphere of the other, if we can think about it that way. And I brought back the colossal dreadlock again. The way that success is measured in Tomb of Annihilation is a familiar one as well. Uh, primarily, Tomb Raider, right? You uncover the, quote, lost city of Omu. I use lost because there are people still living in the city, even though it's referred to the lost city of Omu throughout. You go on an incredible dungeon crawl. You pick up hundreds of thousands of gold, more than any adventuring group could ever carry, only to go back to the one large city, Port Nine Zaru and Schultz, and basically sell these people their own historical artifacts for yourself, right? And of course, they're called discoveries in the text because you are the ones discovering them, apparently. In addition, Tomb of Annihilation gives you the character options, the anthropologist and the archaeologist. I pulled a couple of choice quotes there about what each of them is supposed to act as in the DMV Fifth Edition. I also have here a picture of Laura Bailey and Ashley Johnson. Again, one of the guiding questions behind my work is wondering why do so often we accompany these problematic depictions of colonial life as being what we associate with the TTRPG scene, with fantasy, right? Uh, they obviously caught a lot of flack for this on Twitter. There was some very interesting discourse and very problematic discourse happening to Brian W. Johnson. Um, so the point of all this is just to say narrative mechanics, all synthesizing, coming together uh, in the lost city of Omu, right? Hex crawls and random tables can feel especially oppressive when you are meant to be a colonizer in what is supposed to feel like an oppressive society. Dungeons can feel like tomb raiding. So I try and speed through the rest of this, qualify some of these mechanics as being inherently problematic, and some of them which can very much draw upon the world building, the setting and the narrative that you are trying to tell, right? Hex crawls aren't inherently problematic. They could be really fun in a lot of settings, but when you throw them into a colonizing adventure, they're going to feel oppressive. When you could randomly roll on a table, that can be a lot of fun, but when you randomly roll on a table and encounter cannibalistic goblin groups that portray on stereotypes about the quote tribe with quote exotic, that's going to be problematic as well. And then I'll just try and speed through some of my conclusion here. I'm going to uh, actually have to stop you. But, oh, I'm sorry. About that. Yeah, but maybe just, we can come back to some of these things. That's okay. No, I'm sorry for running over. That's my fault. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, it's good. I mean, this is all food for thought and, and really, really yeah. interesting. Uh, so uh, up next, we have Joseph Isaac from Rutgers uh, University uh, and with a talk called Racialization as a Framework for Race-Based Games, which I, I just, this is one of those panels where I think everything is going to just be in, in conversation with one another. So I'll turn it over to Isaac, or Joseph, sorry. Thank you. Oh, I started advancing the slide accidentally. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is yeah, Joseph Isaac. I'm a rising third year PhD student from media studies at Rutgers. Uh, my research explores board games as methods and sites of analysis with specific interest in how conditions of play are created and forced by the games of precarious living. And today I'll be exploring representations of race and racism within tabletop games. So my plan is just to examine a sample of those games to help make the case that racialization rather than race provides a more fruitful framework for us to spotlight the institutional systems behind racist enforcement. And so the first game is Blacks and Whites. So in March of 1970, a new game made its debut in the pages of Psychology Today. It's called Blacks and Whites. The game offered a critique of those racial barriers which limited non-white success within US society. So in contrast with contemporary books like To Kill a Mockingbird or contemporary films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Blacks and Whites required players to move beyond just empathy and engage with racism in a more immediate way as if they themselves face the disproportionate outcomes experienced by Afro-Americans. But despite its novelty for magazine readers and members of the broader public, the game was likely a familiar one for that subset of board game enthusiasts who clearly understood the game as an adaptation of Monopoly's game mechanics. So its, its premise was simple. Like the original game, players sought to accumulate wealth through the purchase, rent, and sale of property as they traveled along the game board. But unlike that original game, Blacks and Whites offered a twist. Not all players would be treated in the same way by the game's rulebook. So players might land on the same spaces, but their experiences would diverge depending on their identity as a Black or White designated player. So they would draw from different piles of cards, collect different amounts of money, uh, and face different restrictions on the types of properties that they could purchase. 
And this was a game that was developed by Robert Summer and Judy Tart from the University of California, Davis, uh, who broadly described uh, the game as an imagined rather than literal simulation of racial inequality in capitalist America. So they quote, wanted to give middle-class whites a taste of the helplessness uh, that comes from living against implacable odds as they explained in the game's rule sheets, offering distinct conditions of experience derived from a player's designated race. So in the half century since Blacks and Whites was first published, it was published in 1970, tabletop games targeting race and racism have largely followed this fixed race framework, that is the direct correlation of outcomes and life experiences with the player's designated race, which determines how exactly racism manifests for that player. So in the case of a much more uh, contemporary game, Inequalityopoly, which was produced in 2019, play begins when players are born into one of eight perceived identity cards, which illustrate the required dice rolls needed for players to receive or avoid outcomes related to employment, prison, voting rights, intimate partner violence, among many other variables. And it's structured according to data from National Studies as described by the game's designer. The game represents a more nuanced examination of discrimination than its Black and White's counterpart, but yet both games are actually united in the emphasis that they place on the individual experience of discrimination. So in an, a, a, an Hispanic Latinx woman in Inequalityopoly, for example, may have a higher likelihood of inheritance by rolling less than a seven than a black woman who has to roll less than a six, but a black woman receives a higher base salary, $130, than her Hispanic Latinx counterpart. So at the same time as we can appreciate the disproportionate effects of sexism and racism among these groups, we can also see how these identities are composed through the language of nature, such that a player's biological race, quote unquote, is the determining factor of their good or poor fortunes. So this location-based model of identity doesn't really interrogate discrimination's causes or offer a blueprint for how such discrimination can be overcome. So race, as Mira Marks Ferry explains, is an interactive process that takes on multiple gendered meanings that shift according to circumstances of inequality. It cannot be plotted as a series of locations for such an illustration ignores how, quote, the dimensions of inequality themselves are dynamic and in changing mutually con constituted relationships with each other from which they cannot be disentangled. And with little attention as to how race continuously shifts over the course of one's lived experiences, inequalityopoly, like its 1970s counterpart, transforms racism, something an aggressor does, into race, something the target is, as fields and fields write, in a sleight of hand that is easy to miss. So even the case of more critical games, such as the And on Racism Edition, which offers conversational questions designed for players to reflect upon and discuss race, and trading races, which pits players in a debate over which famous figure deserves recognition as the blackest amongst their peers, race becomes reinforced even as it becomes deconstructed. So in the end, two players each ask 12 questions to their respective partner, answering queries such as whether they share the same ideas about race as their family, or whether the questioner has any ideas about race that the answerer believes they should unlearn. The goal, as detailed by the game, is to help players question their own conceptions of racial equity and prejudice, and to explore the human experience of race. In much the same way, trading races encourages players to often humorously confront their own conceptions of blackness as they argue in favor of their respective figures. So pitting notables such as Frederick Douglass against Maya Angelou against Clarence Thomas in their efforts to prove who is the blackest during each round, players reorient their beliefs to the conditions of each game round, confronting their own latent assumptions of black identity and comparing their responses with those of other players. Here, as in the ants, players actively engage with race as a less than stable force, critiquing its boundaries in the space of discussion provided by each game's mechanics. But while the boundaries of race become challenged by debates of blackness, as in trading races, and divergent experiences of racism, as in the ant, the premise of race for each game remains uncontested, and each race is critiqued as something other than what we expect it to be, but which still objectively is, providing an umbrella of causality under which experiences and identities become ascribed. So its outcomes may appear less defined than in the monopoly setting of inequalityopoly in blacks and whites, but the fact of race remains undisputed, with each game suggesting that we merely reorganize rather than rethink how we understand race's conception. But this isn't to argue, obviously, you know, that no value exists in, in any of these games for players who are interested in engaging with the topic of race. So the game of blacks and whites uh, also acted, in addition to sort of having an educational intent, as a broader call to action for the communities which came to play it. So Summer and Tart, who are the game's designers, write that the National Alliance of Businessmen reported that black organizers were using the game to sensitize their white advisors and financiers 
and some are later confirmed the game's adoption as a teaching tool to acquaint people with what it meant to live in an unequal society. So they and others understood the practical value that a game like Blacks and Whites brought for its players who could move beyond a reflective meditation of racism into more active experiments of racial justice and solidarity. And some retorts efforts have even uh, led to the game's 50th anniversary edition release by the comedy duo Never Sad, who have pledged 25% of game proceeds to the National Urban League's housing division. So there are, are also tangible benefits that can come from these kinds of experiments. And in the game of Trading Races, which was inspired by the game designer's experience as the only person of color in a graduate cohort, players often celebrate Black identity in a positive way, affording higher ranked figures who have contributed meaningfully to the Afro-American community. So in their focus on racist outcomes, these and other games allow us to experiment with the divergent outcomes faced by marginalized communities, as in the example of inequalityopoly, and or to compare our conceptions of reality with those of others, as in the case of the ant on racism and sedition. Here, players are encouraged to take risks untied to real-world pressures within an environment that's supportive of graceful failure. And though such games simplify their subjects and situations to help make their concepts more accessible, they also provide a powerful space for us to examine the different impacts that race can have on us and others. But to limit the conversation of race to its effects would be to sharply delimit its conversation to the realm of empathy and experience rather than conditions than the conditions of its manifestation. So in the absence of a structural analysis, any solutions proposed by tabletop games will always focus on an incomplete picture of racism's effects, adjusting the direction of its anti-racist efforts in, in potentially serious ways. So in the game of Blacks and Whites, for example, Black designated players are discouraged from forming cross-racial partnerships with their white counterparts, ignoring the potential culpability of the game's Black elites, so more successful players, and perpetuating systems of discrimination against their poorer racial counterparts. Such economic motivations are elided by the game's rulebook, which levels all players into two flattened classes of income that ignore what Assad Hader describes as the ability of capitalist systems to absorb nationalist challenges against it. So in his analysis of identity politics, Hader points out that, quote, the lingering ideologies of racial unity left over from the Black Power Movement rationalized the top-down control of the Black elite, which worked to obscure class differences as it secured its own entry into the mainstream. So in the game world of Blacks and Whites, the overlapping burdens of labor experienced across racial, class, and gendered lines do not appear in the rhetoric of Black unity, including, Hater notes, any structural challenge to the game's capitalist exploitation. Indeed, to believe in the almost invincible potential of a, quote, well-organized community of Black players, as some are in tar request, ignores this community's place in what Mercer Baradaran describes as the stepchild economy, unable to ever truly succeed amidst the tariffs of segregation and discrimination. So in this conception of justice, whiteness thus becomes an always coherent ideology that splits those coalitions against it, which preemptively restricts any opportunities for cross-racial partnerships to accumulate lasting power. Uh, and so it therefore becomes not just helpful, but necessary to incorporate a structural lens to our anti-racist games to help spotlight the processes of racialization that make certain bodies visible over others and which make race something real. So one such experiment, which will form the second half of this presentation is the self-designed game of race citizenship, which draws on data from the 52 racial prerequisite cases, which came before state and federal courts between 1878 and 1952, and which provided racial restrictions on naturalization. So three day player game, race citizenship situates players as pawns moving their way through the game board as they battle unstable conceptions of whiteness and the demands of capitalism in their pursuit of citizenship. Uh, framing fundamental questions about who could join citizenry in terms of who was white, racial prerequisite cases adopted shifting standards of whiteness within their legal judgments, underscoring what Haney Lopez described as the complex relations of power at work within those historical periods. And of central import of these shifts, Susan Goshi argues, are the manifestations of race created by global capitalism, more specifically the resistance and complicity of intermediary racial groups within that system. And so rather than endorse, quote, an implicit model chromatic capitalism in which oppressors are white and their victims are non-white, race to citizenship instead asks players to move towards a more nuanced appreciation of how race becomes reinforced by conflicts between labor and capital and how players can themselves contribute often unwittingly to the conditions of their degradation. The game is at its core, a race to the finish, uh, an intentional play on words that draws on the legacy of competition created by racial prerequisite cases. Who struggle for whose plaintiffs struggle for recognition as white help define the boundaries of racial hierarchies. So here, players select at random one of eight pawns, which affects potential alliances and the conditions created by gameplay. Rather than provide players with real-world designations of race, this game instead of randomly assigns players the ability to play as squares or triangles designed with the colors of blue, green, orange, or pink. And rather than provide each color with a fixed racial hierarchy, pawns are stratified according to the game's condition cards, which offer positive or negative conditions to players 
based on either their pawn color, pawn shape, and or on the game board space that they've currently landed on. So these conditions are determined by the game's randomly selected 12-sided condition die. Uh, there are four possible options, so players select one at random after they've already selected their pieces, uh, and which favors certain pawn colors and shapes over others. So blue triangles may be heavily favored on one die, but on another they may be the least likely. So building on research insights and help text drawn from Susan Koshi and Kiambi Yamada Taylor, condition cards and the condition die create privileges and penalties which test the strength of player coalitions. So like the issues of affirmative action and welfare reform, which split racial coalitions in the 1960s and 1970s, these cards shift whiteness away from specific players and refocus them onto the difference of impact created by game conditions. So this shift supports a more critical investigation of race that asks not just how intermediary groups resist or support systems of capitalism, but also how whiteness can itself become oppositional as opposed to merely always oppressive. So each turn's actions are typically decided during a player's turn when based on the roll of 2d12 dice, they may either re-roll the condition die, collect a money token, move along the game board, or draw a racing card. So largely this section of, or the, the items on this slide were largely inspired by Saad Hader's work. So money tokens are probably the most significant feature of the game and that it's impossible for players to achieve citizenship without them. These tokens are most often paid in the form of fines to the game board, whose spaces include a number of lane tolls that require payment for any passage through or residence on those spaces. And in addition to lane tolls, the game board also includes protection squares, which provide temporary protection from attacks by other players, and player squares, which allow players to receive the potential benefits or disadvantages of the game's condition cards by providing them with the dual identity of that game board space. Finally, the game's racing cards are used by players to either attack or defend against their opponents, drawing a part on the four rationales identified by Ian Haney Lopez as those typically used by judges to decide racial prerequisite cases. So common knowledge, congressional intent, scientific evidence, and legal precedent. So social relocations, which is the first card, push players sideways or forwards and rely on the common knowledge rationale that appeal to popular conceptions of race, arbitrarily pushing players in directions based on where the attacking player feels they quote should be. Congressional laws block players from landing on certain board squares, and they rely on the congressional intent rationale that interpreted the intent behind certain laws, penalizing players according to the interpreted de desires of Congress. Racial science changes player squares on the game board into lane tools for specific players, and it relies on the scientific evidence rationale, echoing the physical and objective, quote unquote, objective characteristics <coughs> cited by racial scientists as evidence for racial inferiority. And Supreme Court rulings, which ban a player from traveling game board lane of the attacker's choosing, rely on the legal precedent rationale that relied on the decisions of earlier cases, specifically focusing on the finality of decisions offered by Supreme Court cases. But players may also defend against such attacks. So influenced by Assad Hader and Mursa Baradaran, nationalist redirects redirect a player's attack against any color or shape, but they also illustrate the greater risk of fracture that race exclusive coalitions may face and the problems of limiting revolution to identity-based entry. And scapegoats, uh, which is influenced by Deepak Kumar's work on terrorcraft, add plus one value to any number of attack against its attached player. So specifically applying to social relocation, congressional laws, and racial science, emphasizing how some groups become suddenly class can become suddenly classified as suspect and other under deteriorating economic conditions. And just some concluding thoughts: there are a number of strategies players can adopt to navigate the game. Uh, forming temporary permanent coalitions with one another to navigate their way through the game board. These coalitions might involve agreements not to attack one another, or they might involve strategies of resource depletion among cards and tokens. So for example, there's only 128 money tokens in the game, so players can begin hoarding and restrict the type of progress that players, other players make during gameplay. But even the best coalitions can find themselves fractured as collateral damage from condition cards, which might situate players once aligned into spaces of conflict illustrating not just the instability of whiteness, but the variability with which race may be applied or manifest. And so with different outcomes that frustrate any easy understanding of race, race citizenship thus complicates the fixed race framework of this presentation's earlier games, arguing that tabletop games focused on racialization allows us to spotlight race's many contradictions and the dimensions of our own culpability or potential culpability in its reinforcement. Yeah, but like the examples of blacks and whites, inequalityopoly, the and on racism addition and trading races, Racist citizenship offers merely the start of rather than final word for this exploration, acting as a proof of concept for how we might begin to think of reorient and expand our difficult conversations about race. And that's my presentation because I think I'm at time. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Again, really interesting. Um, okay, moving right along. Up next, we have Merrick Stoli. 
uh, from University of California, Santa Cruz uh, on Africa on the moon, the thin gray area between analog and digital play. I turn it over to you. Great. All right. Um, so hi, I'm, uh, I'm Eric Soli, so I'm going to set up a timer. Um, so I am a lecturer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, and in the fall, I'm, I'm an incoming PhD student uh, in the text and technology program at the University of Central Florida. Um, so my presentation is titled Africa on the Moon. Um, so in 2019, um, a game called The Scramble for Africa, designed by Cho Chekhan, was uh, announced and then later canceled after an outcry um, from the public about the uh, colonial themes of a game called The Scramble for Africa. Um, so it was set up for the P5, P500 pre-order system through GMT Games um, and was canceled by the company. Um, and this prompted uh, a couple articles, uh, one in 2019 on Vice, um, discussing, you know, bringing, expanding this conversation about colonialism in board games to a broader audience. Um, in 2021, a, an article in The Atlantic by Luke Winkie um, announced that a reckoning is coming um, in terms of this sort of theming um, in board games. Um, so it, through, a, you know, there is a neoliberal incentive um, for publishers to get away from these sort of things now that there is this, this sort of bad press around this. Despite this, we see, still see games like 2020's um, uh, my Reiner Knizia game, My City, unabashedly using the tagline, Manifest Your Destiny. Um, uh, other games are trying to, uh, you know, the question is for existing games um, that are very successful, such as the game Puerto Rico, um, came out in 2002. You know, what can we do if the game is already colonialist, but it is a very successful game that many people enjoy. Um, so uh, in terms of Puerto Rico, they've decided to release a new edition that takes place in a different year um, within a two year uh, span in which Puerto Rico was uh, no longer uh, colonized until it was colonized by um, the United States. But um, so uh, my presentation is about a specific approach to adapting an existing game uh, which has been uh, you know, panned for its colonialist approach um, and trying to make it uh, into something less problematic. And that game is a 2015 game Mombasa by Alexander Pfister. Um, so uh, in, I'm sorry, I've got to get rid of this uh, thing here. Um, so uh, the, in 2021, we see uh, a Before You Play YouTube channel. Uh, they uh, critique the theme of Mombasa. And Alexander Pfister himself comments in saying that hopefully he will be able to get rid of the theme of Mombasa in the near future, as he doesn't like it either. Um, so Mombasa is a game about colonizing Africa. Um, so instead, we now see in the fall upcoming, they were releasing a game called Sky Mines, which is a re-implementation of Mombasa's mechanics, um, but instead of colonizing Africa, you are instead colonizing the moon. Um, but uh, using a framework uh, called Operational Logics, um, developed by Noah Wardrip Fruin and introduced in the book How Pac-Man Eats, um, we can examine um, these sort of mechanics and theme and how they work together. Um, so operational logics divide mechanics or logics um, uh, into abstract processes, so rules um, devoid of theme, um, plus the communicative roles happening through the fiction of the game and through uh, you know, the, the components, the names, these sort of things. Um, so in, in uh, more you know, uh, colloquial board game terms, we might call these the combination of rules and theme. So in mechanics and theme coming together. So uh, in Mombasa, if we look at this sort of what's going on mechanically and thematically in Mombasa, um, per the rule book, in Mombasa, players acquire shares of chartered companies and spread their trading posts throughout the African continent in order to earn the most money. Chartered companies were associations formed for the purpose of exploration, trade, and colonization, which links them inextricably to a very dark chapter in human history, global colonialism. So we see this sort of acknowledgement um, of, this, of the theme and its problematic nature um, in the rule book itself for Mombasa. Um, but uh, they uh, provide a sort of defense saying, although Mombasa is loosely set within the time frame of global colonization, it is not a, his a historical simulation. It is a strategy game with an economic focus that roughly refers to historical categories and places them in a fictional setting. So this is uh, ostensibly not our Africa. This is not trying to simulate 
the real Africa, but instead some sort of fictional alternate universe. Um, but we can see there is this theme, regardless of, uh, of whether it is our Africa or not, this is about chartered companies in Africa engaging in colonization and players investing in those companies. Um, so if we start looking at sky mines, the real re-implementation of these same mechanics, um, we can uh, examine this through the lens of what Noah Wardrop Fruin calls reskinning, which is where in terms of the operational logics, we keep the same abstract processes, the same base rules, um, but provide a new theme, a new communicative role, of which uh, we can think of as the new theme of colonizing the moon instead. Um, so instead of taking those same mechanics from Mombasa with some slight tweaks um, and uh, re-theming it to be about companies on the moon instead. Um, so using, uh, uh, to do a more uh, deep dive on the operational logics of Mombasa and sky mines, uh, we can use a couple different types of logics um, that Wardrobe Fruin discusses. Those are resource logics and linking logics. So resource logics are about um, the collection and distribution of resources. Um, in an abstract sense, you know, th these resources can be anything, just something that is numerical. Um, and we can see if we look at the Mombasa rule book, we have a number of different resources. In an abstract sense, these are, you know, these are just, again, resources um, devoid of theme. Um, but once we start adding the components, the material components of the game, um, and the ways in which those components are referred to, we can see these become representations of capital, of trading posts, um, uh, in, in diamonds, natural resources within um, the, the African continent. Um, and distributed uh, between the chartered companies and the investors involved. Um, so between Mombasa and Sky Mines, the resource logics are the same. We can see the exact same um, resources uh, abstractly are used, um, but given a new theme, trading posts um, become, uh, sorry, pounds instead become crip coin, um, presumably some sort of cryptocurrency, we'll return to that. Um, trading posts become outposts, diamonds become helium three, um, and ink jar markers become upload markers. So we have a, a applied a new set of paint to the same mechanics. Um, and in terms of linking logics, um, linking logics are about the connections between spaces. Um, so we can see the linking logics at work in Mombasa by examining the, the, the board, um, which is a representation, a, a cartographic representation of the, uh, uh, the continent of Africa. Um, so if we look at these different regions within this area, um, we can see connections between them uh, and some of which uh, require more resources to cross. And we can create a node map uh, representing the nodes, the spaces um, and the linkages between them. If we look at the upcoming Sky Mines board, um, we can see uh, that we can do the same process. And in actuality, um, these two node maps are exactly the same. Um, in an abstract sense, uh, the map of Sky Mines is exactly the same as that of Mombasa, although it appears to be slightly different. We can even see the representation of the moon um, takes the rough shape of the continent of Africa, given, given this, uh, this cutout we can see in the bottom left. Um, so when these resource logics and linking logics combine, we get a playable model of colonization, a particular way in which this game represents uh, colonization. Um, so we can see um, one of the main actions you'll be doing in this game is placing new trading posts across this, this map of nodes. So we can see I place if I can place a res uh, trading post in a new zone, I get a resource. So in this case, um, I would get a diamond. If I, on a later turn, I expanded to this region, I will get two pounds. Um, so what's happening here, um, well, this is something where obviously I am in a, in a figurative sense expanding the reach of these companies across the continent and extracting resources um, from that. Um, and this is an action that players will be encouraged to do many times throughout the game um, because a major way that you score points is by um, increasing the values of companies by uh, removing trading posts from their home boards. So we can see if I take this action, I can make this company worth two more points. And then depending on how many shares I have in that company at the end of the game, I will get a certain amount of points um, based on the value of that company. So we can see Mombasa is a model of the colonization of Africa, a particular viewpoint of that process. Um, so we can see the mechanics tell a story of expansion and exploitation um, in th that particular, those mechanics are being done on the historical 
um, in a historical setting of the continent of Africa. Sky mines, ostensibly, is less problematic. It's something we're still colonizing, but we're now we're on the moon, right? Um, these same expansion, I mean, same uh, mechanics of expansion and exploitation uh, take place on in, in a new setting, right? A new theme. Um, but in an abstract sense, what's happening in this expansion, we can see I am going, I'm expanding a network I am, and to new, uh, new locations, and I'm receiving resources. Even if this is very abstract, this is the exact same thing that's happening with the new set of paint in sky mines. Um, so both of these mechanics, Mombasa and sky mines, these shared mechanics encourage the expansion of networks and exploitation of resources. That is simply in an abstract sense, what is going on according to these logics. Um, notably, this is one model of, uh, of uh, colonization that does not include um, any people, right, besides the chartered companies involved. Um, and this is a defense offered in the Mombasa rulebook. The exploitation of the African continent and its people is not explicitly depicted within the gameplay. They're not included, right? We can see nowhere in this, in this model of expansion um, do, does it include, you know, the displacement or um, a conquering of, of people within this. So this could be seen as a defense of, of you know, this is not a violent uh, colonization game. Um, but we can see this model of colonization is a particular model of colonization that does not include indig indigenous people at, at all. They are not included um, in the game in any sort of representation. Um, this is, you know, we can think of games like Catan, uh, which are colonial in their mechanics, but taking place in a fictional environment that does not have indigenous people involved. Um, so if we look at sky mines, this moon provides this, the moon provides some sort of mythical colonization setting in which Wow, it's the moon. There are no indigenous people um, that we don't have to model them now. Um, they don't have to be included in the model. Um, so maybe, uh, but this is, you know, obviously this, uh, you know, uh, ignores any sort of the actual actuality of the material, imp um, material impact that colonization had on the African people. Um, uh, you know, in the Mombasa rule book, they, they say, you know, Mombasa is set within this time frame, but it's not a historical simulation. You know, they are um, trying to distance themselves from this. But if so, then why set it in this setting? Um, another defense they seem to offer is that it is a strategy game with an economic focus. This is not a game. This is not a war game. This is not a game with troops um, and people represented. It's all very abstract um, in that sense. If we think of, of the genre of 4X games, we are not exploring, we are simply expanding and exploiting. We are not exterminating. This is not a game about building an empire um, in the sense that we might think of other games like the Civilization uh, PC series. Um, but I think this the fact that this game is a Euro game and is focused on the strategic uh, collection of resources and economics, um, this really reveals um, it, this model reveals a particular view of colonization, which is driven by capital um, and uh, does not um, care about the indigenous people in, that, in the way of pr that pursuit of profit. Um, we can see, you know, uh, this is coins um, of pounds and crypt coin um, in the new version of Sky Mines. Uh, you know, we can see we are in pursuit of, of money, and that is the, the driving factor that is driving the, the players to play these games and engage in these colonistic actions. So um, Noah Wardrop Fruin notes, you know, while we can make games appear to be about different things through reskinning, you know, Sky Mines attempting to make this a game um, not about colonization um, in theory, um, we cannot get away from what is fundamentally present in the logics and models. Um, and in this case, the, those logics and models are about expansion and exploitation um, to major parts of colonization. Um, and in the particular models taken from Sky Mines, this node map um, bar that is inspired by the geography and topography of, um, of Africa, um, the way that it is directly taken um, to Sky Mines uh, without any sort of changes, um, this takes Sky Mines direct, um, it connects Sky Mines directly to the original setting of Africa. So Sky Mines uh, is about capitalist colonization in Africa, even if that Africa is now on the moon. We've, this coat of paint does not, uh, Get the game away from its roots. So I'm not sure exactly, you know, what is to be done. What is the solution um, to trying to decolonize existing games? Um, but I can see that uh, this approach of simply reskinning um, is not enough. Um, I think more mechanical changes would be necessary. So 
Awesome. Thank you all very much. Um, again, I'm Eric Soli. Um, I will talk to you all in the Q&A. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. And rounding out the panel and the afternoon uh, is we have uh, Brandon Blackburn. Um, and uh, hopefully this paper sounds like we're going to blow up stuff. So maybe this will provide some solutions on settler destruction. Thank you so much, Edwin. Let me just um, share my screen and get my presentation up and running. OK. Great. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, wonderful. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm a researcher at UCI working on games and related media, looking at intersections of race, queerness, um, monsters, and horror in those spaces. And I'm going to be talking to you today about themes of colonization and decolonization in the game Spirit Island, uh, the cooperative settler destruction strategy game. It's a 2017 game by Eric Royce in which players play as the guardian deities of a remote island, seeking to defend their home from encroaching settlers. It flips the common trope of resource management of an unpopulated virginal land in Euro games such as Catan, um, originally settlers of Catan, that rely on abstract pieces and numerically based resource management. Instead, in Spirit Island, players must cooperate to oppose settler colonization as it happens in real time. Yes. This talk will have two parts. First, I will give a bit of background explaining what I mean by colonial and decolonial. I will also discuss two techniques I will use to frame my argument. Then I will give an analysis about specific aspects of Spirit Island that illustrate my points. In terms of colonialism, I rely predominantly on Richard Dreyer's book, White. Um, it's a bit of an older text, but nonetheless quite foundational for framing my thoughts in this talk. He talks a lot about symbol and motif as well as connoted power, all of which are themes central in this work. For Dyer, whiteness and colonialism go hand in hand, colonialism being the process by which whiteness becomes violently established in a place denoted as natural or otherwise subaltern. Critically, decolonization exists in opposition to this process, not as it happens, but after it has already happened. Colonization must establish whiteness as background in order to permit the violence necessary to maintain it. Narrative and voice, therefore, become critical decolonial efforts in destabilizing the banality of white violence. Games can be a critical space for expressing these efforts, as Marisa Bertola, Ilaria Mariani, and Eleonora Al Albert, um, sorry, Alberto um, Conti write in their chapter Discrimination in the Collection Woke Gaming. So speaking about the game design groups, Games for Social Change, they write, as powerful cultural objects, uh, products, games shape and contribute to structuring both individuals and society's perspectives of the world. Because of their aim, the meanings they embed, um, and the, the experience they engender, games for social change exist as a powerful system that is able to represent abstract and reduce complex and articulated situations. The best possibilities of games for social change are those that enable players to have a firsthand experience of issues otherwise not easy to notice, analyze, or understand. I would like to complicate this last claim about enabling a firsthand experience. While this practice is a useful move for pulling focus and drawing attention to underrepresented experiences, we must be careful not to trivialize or essentialize the experiences we are seeking to elevate. Indeed, scholars like Bo Ruberg and Teddy Pozo have critiqued so-called empathy games as harmfully reductive. As Ruberg writes in their article, Empathy and its Alternatives, Deconstructing the Rhetoric of Empathy in Video Games, it is time to start calling the emotions and experiences that currently cluster under the umbrella term empathy by their names. Out in the open, without the cover of empathy as a catch-all buzzword, sympathy, that depth, and allyship become more visible and therefore more accessible for critique. Caring, compassion, sorrow, loss, and queer entanglement are powerful concepts that deserve to be spoken out loud, not lost in the rhetoric of empathy. Therefore, before I go too much farther, I want to revisit and clarify my argument. In spite of its themes, Spirit Island is not a decolonial board game. It operates in and makes use of colonial mechanics and trivializes many complex and traumatic aspects of settler colonialism. I still think, however, that it is a valuable game for discussing anti-racism and absolutely one worth playing. 
Decolonialism is not an independent force outside of colonial space, but is instead a space nested fully within it. It seeks to operate oppositionally to colonialism, yet is definable only in its relation to colonialism. As Dyer writes in White, whiteness colonizes even the representation of ordinary deviance. In other words, it is possible for a space within hegemonic whiteness that is paradoxically designated as anti-white to exist. Rather than view uh, decolonialism as a separate opposing force to colonialism, it is far more useful for this talk to, con to consider decolonialism as nested fully within a backdrop of colonial space. In spite of its goals and framing, Spirit Island exists entirely in a colonial space populated by colonial Euro games. This observation may seem like a step backward, but it is in fact critical for recognizing the value of, pay of playing the game as anti-racist. My second technique is reading small. Alluding to D.A. Miller's too close reading of the Hitchcock film Rope, uh, which Bo Rubik references in their chapter, Getting Too Close, Portal, Anal Rope, and the Perils of Queer Interpretation, I want to look not at a huge paradigm shift in the game, but at small ripples and disturbances in colonial space. As Rubik explains, Miller uses his reading of Rope to critique the response that queer uh, connotative readings of texts are invalid because the conclusions they produce are often not as explicitly stated as conclusions possible in more denoted meanings. These, um, these denoted meanings are hegemonic modes of thought that can be become tied to or even limited by strictly representational politics, which obscure the dynamic interplay between Spirit Island and the Eurogame scene more broadly than my analysis depends on. My analysis of Spirit Island comes into focus only by reading it as a game that engages with and actively converses with past Eurogames in order to make subtle critiques that will be visible to people well-versed in their history. By reading small, I don't just mean close reading, though this talk will rely heavily on this technique. Instead, I mean that I'm concerned primarily with the small individual pieces and mechanics that make up the game. Each of these seemingly minor parts disrupts and complicates the already troubled space of tabletop games and may ripple into larger, more tangible changes when viewed in broader context. For instance, I want to take a look at the game's material components. There is a clear demarcation between the pieces used for colonizers and those used for elements related to the island. On the one hand, towns, cities, and explorers, which are settler pieces, are all hard angular plastic. Uh, they have clear mold marks alluding to their transparent mass production, but furthermore, they cling together. The explorers, especially, are hard to separate. When you try to grab one, you often end up grabbing two or three. All the settler pieces come to sharp points, making them quite unpleasant to step on, with the exception of blight pieces. These plastic pieces are used in games uh, to represent the harmful effects of colonizers' presence on the island and depict rounded pustules, as though indicating the putrefaction of Spirit Island's environment by colonizing forges. The island pieces, on the other hand, are all made from spoos painted wood or cardboard. They are easy to move in place and are pleasant to hold. It is in these pieces that the game showcases its art and flavor. The spirit names, such as river surges in sunlight or shadows flicker like flames, tell compelling stories that stand in direct opposition to the interchangeability of the settler pieces. Even if one plays with the nation's alternative rule set, which denotes specific colonizing countries like Britain or France, the settler pieces are still interchangeable, further re-emphasizing this distinction. The names of island pieces themselves connote narratives, which are buoyed by the playability of the associated pieces. When I have played this game, uh, the people I play with tend to role play the spirit movements and powers, centering their desires and drives above those of the colonizers. The creation of narrative in decolonial space is vitally important to anti-racist efforts. Post-narrative turns historical scholars view history as a narrative that is created wholly in the present rather than an inaccessible teleology of events that in the inaccessible past. Dominant historical narratives persist not necessarily because they are fair or even accurate, but because they hold societal power. Collaborative storytelling efforts, therefore, are vital in upsetting this hegemonic space. Spirit Island, while being a collaborative game, is asymmetrical in its play. Players are all working toward the same goal to rid the island of invaders, but they are, will not necessarily want to go about doing it the same way. Depending on spirit choice and play style, one might try to damage cities, prevent builds, or even forego damage altogether and scare colonizers off the island. These differing methods might complement each other and make tasks easier, or they might completely undermine the efforts of other players at the table. Effective communication and long-term planning are vital in efficiently making moves. In other words, the game relies on compromises and frictions in order not just to win, but even to play. If a player tries to dominate, everyone will almost certainly lose. 
My point here is not that compelled balance or compromise are inherently decolonial, but that recognizing the validity of multiple methods would be extremely useful in collaborative anti-colonial efforts. So far, I've discussed mechanics and components in Spirit Island, which while not unique to this game, can in decolonial context connote anti-racist efforts. But such efforts are useless if they are accessible only to those who have no interest in reading them as such. Spirit Island is a highly modular, highly complex, and indeed highly punishing game. Even playing at the easiest difficulty, a beginner would likely lose the first time they played. Losing in a game can be a frustrating experience, particularly with the Euro game scene being as insular and exclusive as it is. Numerous scholars, many of whom are in this panel, um, have identified and critiqued the difficulty of entering board game culture as an outsider, and Spirit Island would likely be a frustrating game for a person who had never played games to start with. But while it's true um, that it would not be my first pick for a first time player, I do think it would be a very good game to introduce a person familiar with basic board game mechanics to more complex crunchy or mechanics forward ones. Beyond welcome details like easy to find components and carefully laid out rule books, uh, Spirit Island ranks spirits by complexity and play style and even has suggestions for upgrade paths and card picks, which you can see just to the right of that image there so that a beginner can play alongside board game veterans and still meaningfully contribute to the session. The game also has modular difficulty settings, so it is a good game to learn with and refine play style and strategy. And because I have mentioned earlier, the mechanics in Spirit Island are largely commonplace in complex board games. The skills learned are transferable to less accessible games. In presenting its numerous complex mechanics as it does, Spirit Island provides a pathway for people who would otherwise be excluded from the crunchy, punishing, hardcore board game space a way in while simultaneously providing a space where such players can refine skills and dial in the difficulty of the experience they want to have playing the game. Alluding to Ruberg's work on empathy games, I think we ought to get away from the rhetoric of decolonial games. In this talk, I have del not delved into the many racist and colonial shortcomings of Spirit Island, but I have shown that seeking to categorize the game as solely unbounded colonial or decolonial object is irresponsible. Such rhetoric implies that we can neatly reduce something as complex as decolonization to a discrete consumable package, an idea that is itself inherently colonial. Instead, we ought to recognize that even the most well-intentioned games inherently exist within colonial space, which is a massive paradigm that is the backdrop for anything that happens in our society. As long as we remain within colonial space, we must complicate our approach to decolonial efforts, but by reading small and reading in context, we can seek to use games not to decolonize, but instead to trouble the ways we engage within the space of decolonization. So thank you very much. I'm happy to provide bibliographical information um, to either my slides or to my talk to anyone who would like to see it. Um, thank you so much for your time and um, an extra special thanks to CATS, UCI, TRIP, um, as well as my friends who um, made it out here to be with me today. Please check out PB's talk um, tomorrow. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So uh, as we as you stop sharing and we go back to kind of uh, normal view, I'm going to ask the the panelists to you know be on camera so that we can see everyone. Um, and then if you have questions, make sure that you can type them into the Q and A area. Um, and uh, I will um, read them out loud. So as that's populating, maybe I'll start with a question of mine. Um, I'm really interested in all these. I think there are um, resonances, again, sort of uh, pun intended, between this panel and the last panel uh, and among other things. But um, uh, maybe the, the question that sort of stuck out to me is this issue of individuality. And maybe we'll start there because I think everybody kind of touched on this to some degree and this idea that these quote unquote empathy games or these games that are trying to either grapple with their sort of prob problematic natures and or you know maybe digging their heels into them um, often places this idea of like you know doing an anti-racist or a feminist or queer or a decolonizing or indigenizing game is really placed in the hands of the individual player um, and how might we problematize this idea of, of individuality, relatability, identification? So that's for the whole board. Uh oh, worst thing that can happen. Stump everybody. <laughs> I can try to start it. No, no, no I, I can try to start. Um, 
Yeah, I think at least in the context of sort of the games that I was looking at, uh, just because I really wanted my presentation to be focused on like games that like were explicitly about race um, or that like tried to deal with racism. Um, and I think, and there, and there is like a, and there is a value to sort of that individual experience. I think that that can, like trading races is, is a really good example where you sort of, you can have these kinds of conceptions of blackness as you're playing that game that may be latent from you that you don't really realize until you actually argue. It, and then you're like, Ooh, is that, is that really what I want to argue? Or it's interesting to also hear the different justifications that people like may have and how they conceptualize blackness in a way different from you. Uh, and so those games are actually, I think, sort of very useful. There's like another game I didn't talk about, I think called, um, it's called White People the Game. It's like a drinking game essentially where like you point to the figure who like wears shorts in winter or, or something like that, but it's meant to be satirical and it's sort of meant to, and I think through gameplay, like there's a lot of really interesting aspects of sort of knowledge and awareness that can come through through gameplay. I think sort of the critique that I had about that is that those tend to be sort of the only games that really exist. Uh, and while they do have benefits, there is still a limit to sort of how much we can really understand race uh, just, just from those games alone, uh, which isn't to say like those games should do that. Like it's hard for a game to do everything. Like no game can do everything. Uh, but I, I do think that that's like sort of a really important part of the conversation that we tend to avoid or ignore or, or try to sort of like adopt pre-existing frameworks like monopoly is a super popular way for a lot of games to like talk about race so like i talked about inequality Opoly, and blacks and whites but there are even a lot of educators who use monopoly to talk about uh, income inequality who use it to talk about uh sort of gen like uh like uh sexism and and other examples that, that used to talk about race that i didn't cite as well um and it's it's sort of there tends to be a limit when you try to adopt sort of a pre-existing framework that's not really suited to, dis to describe these really complex issues. And it tends to sort of be a shortcut that people tend to do. Um, and there's a lot, and so that's to say, like, I feel like there's not as much creativity necessarily in those games, those games that like adopt Monopoly uh, as games like Trading Races or games, even like White People the Game, where it's sort of meant to sort of compare different experiences that people may have. Uh, that's sort of like my initial broad thoughts if anybody has yeah. has anything to add to that or to contradict i'm actually super interested to hear what everyone thinks about it um i mean to the point of monopoly specifically yeah i think it's i mean i think this connects to a couple of the different things monopoly is a rule set that is known uh, at least in america by many people um so i think it's a sort of shorthand and so like the idea of spirit island being something that's harder to learn um introduction to harder game mechanics you know maybe um, that is part of the reason why, um, you know, it might not, uh, a game using Monopoly might have a wider audience to reach. Um, but then I guess in terms of like the operational logics of Monopoly, you know, it is a game about accumulation um, and about um, certain things. So to try to make it about something else is difficult. Um, I also think it's interesting that Monopoly has um, like reactionary, uh, there's like this Monopoly socialism that came out a couple of years ago that was like meant to be like a parody of socialism in which everyone's poor. Um, so I feel like it's being used for for the other side of it as well. So I don't know, that's that's my thoughts on that oh, particular yeah. part. Every technology can be used for <laughs> yeah. and yeah. for oppression, so. Um, Oh, okay, we have a couple of questions. Let me, uh, you can jump in if you had questions or responses to that first one, but I think we're getting to these sorts of ideas. Uh, this one's from Andre. This question is from Mark, uh, but anyone's free to chime in. Uh, you showed some Mag Magic the Gathering cards while discussing the OSR and WTC. How do you feel that uh, the kind of fantasy ethnospheres of game uh, the game produces are the same or in some ways distinct from those of D&D? Uh, either in their chosen themes or their mechanics? So the that, that's a fantastic question. I obviously incorporated the uh, Colossal Dreadnought because it's a meme card, but it's also from Ixalan. And Ixalan and its representation is very similar to the way that Cholt is presented in Dungeons and Dragons, right? So aesthetically, these fantasy ethnospheres are very, very similar. And I think relating back to previous uh, previous presentations today, I think you could say a lot of the same for the Egyptian, the Viking, the Japanese representations that we've seen throughout Wizards card printing. They're not going for a legitimate representation of the thing. They're going for what they assume that their fan be, that their fan base will assume the thing to be like. And they're building a sort of 
Ceres and Jenga tower of signs and symbols on top of each other alongside mechanics that will appeal to people, right? And so they're not going to appeal to the mechanic that an actual historian might say is representative of the culture, but rather they're going to appeal to a pop culture sensation of one. Obviously those fantasy atmospheres, um, because magic and D&D are different games, people are going to interact with them differently. I think they are a bit more strongly understood in D&D because we are imagining scene together so that people innately have to communicate those signs and symbols in order to best communicate meaning. That's why I think that racist depictions of orcs and drow and other cultures in D&D have stood around for so long. They're a sort of fantasy shorthand for communicating those ideas. Um, that's kind of my thoughts. I would love to hear anyone else's as part of the panel. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know. I just, I just want to weigh in here because I think what's interesting, especially Mark with your work in these communities that want to sort of police a certain kind of like, I don't know, authenticity, constitutionalist, you know, whatever, you know, sort of attention to games that uh, in a lot of ways, I can see this sort of like circular uh, world where the game that is supposed to be set in like medieval, you know, Japan, uh, if it's too quote unquote realistic or is trying to address these social justice issues, quote unquote cultural issues, then what they really want is the made up version and that's the more authentic version. And so there's this sort of weird, like, um, uh, you, know, tump, you know, circular thing that happens. Um, Alexander asks, uh, linking Merrick's and uh, uh, Mark's presentation, I would like to put this question over to Mark. Do you think that besides thematics and representation, uh, there are any particular mechanics in OSR that bring forward those kinds of fascist personalities and conservative thinking? Kind of, uh, again, a fantastic question. Kind of, I think the crux behind my thought is that you can't take mechanics by themselves and say that they are inherently liable to produce fascist or Christian nationalist rhetoric at the table, but it's when you combine them with themes as other people at the, at the panel have pointed out, right? I think the most common example that I use is people when they play D&D for the first time are very quickly to align themselves with guards and go take out some persecuted outside of civilization group in order to attain goal. I, there's no mechanic in the OSR that says that that's how you have to play the game. I think that those mechanics often synthesize together with the themes that OSR communities, not all, again, like the, the kinds of that the folks that I'm talking about, uh, those mechanics are the ones that are liable to come together because, well, it's interesting you brought up that kind of circular logic, Edmund, because the same people who are saying that's not what the world is like are the same people who say you can't change orcs. Orcs are like this, right? Orcs don't exist. <laughs> I see it. Aaron has his hand raised. Go for it. I'm trying to look at too many things. Aaron? Yeah, uh, every, everybody, this, this panel was uh, amazing. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, uh, I, I had a question for Brandon, um, but again, this is open for the entire panel. If uh, folks want to comment on it, because I think it's relevant to all the presentations. Um, so Brendan, I love how you ended um, with sort of a revision of Bo's call to um, rethink what we are masking with the term uh, decolonize, right? Like what what uh, what other uh, terms might lie beneath that term? So I was curious if you might share um, a little more with the panel, some of the implications of what that unmasking might do for games, uh, what other terms we might find there. And then I was curious if maybe other folks on the panel want to weigh in on uh, some of the ways that uh, perhaps uh, their work might intersect with that unmasking. Okay. Thank you for your question, Aaron. So I think it comes down to sort of how the term positions games, um, because I think that the term decolonization in a game space and categorizing a game neatly as that sort of sets up a false uh, dichotomy. Um, between games that are decolonizing and games that are not. When in reality, there's it's more like nested concentric circles. Like there's colonial space that includes games, that includes Euro games, that includes every kind of game. And in that space, there are people trying to do 
things that resist those dominant paradigms. So there are a whole bunch of different ways to do that, but by setting them up as kind of one or, as an all or nothing response, um, I think that we obscure the subtler methods that uh, that designers uh, try to uh, express uh, that those complications. And I think that we foreclose um, the player ability to um, interact with that space as well. So for instance, if you're playing um, D and D and you don't want to, um, to Mark's point, uh, have you know, your players go and murder a bunch of people who are just happen to be outside the city, you can choose to do that. Like, that's a thing you can just do, you know? And I, I think that I'm trying to find a way to recognize um, those efforts as well um, as, as being valid in that space and being part of and, and, and fueled by the game. Other responses? I, I think that's a point really well made, Brandon, and your imagery of concentric circles is actually a very useful image for me to think about that kind of act as well. I mean, yeah, to, to speak more, I think, to D&D, &D, which is a good example, as you put, it's like, until the system as a whole was kind of burned down and brought back up, I don't think you're going to escape a lot of these colonialist tendencies within the game. It originated as a war game, as a, as a plundering game, right? We still refer to these things as races, even though race is a social construct and race as it exists in D&D is decidedly not like race exists in our real life world, right? You can still write, what? A, attempting to be decolonial or anti-colonial narratives within that. I mean, we just had a uh, journey through the Radiant Citadel published, and that seems to be at least Wizards' most financial, largest financial attempt at doing something like that in a while. But it still, it still is within that sphere, like you talked about. That's a helpful way to think about it. There's a question in Q&A by Sophie. Uh, this is for Brandon. I was really interested in how you paid attention to the materiality of the game pieces in your talk. Would you say that this is a common practice while designing an analog game? Um, I think it, it depends. Um, it depends on exactly what you want the pieces to do. Um, so it's something I tend to think about, but you know, I, we also study things like that. Um, I find that people tend to notice it more when it's designed poorly. Um, so it's one of those, like you only notice it if it fails sorts of thing, although that's a false paradigm too. But um, people tend to notice uh, bad, badly designed game pieces uh, more so than I think that they notice uh, good ones because good ones are going to augment uh, gameplay and sort of allow you a way um, into and facilitate that uh, experience. I think about the fur over like the the change in monopoly piece of, uh, tokens, right? Like again, this gets back to like, no, it's OG or no, this is you know we need to make space for new ones or you know whatever. So yeah, I think to uh, Brent because that is that is a really good point from Brent as well. Yeah, he tends to notice it when it when it goes poorly, um, or when someone sort of hasn't put as much thought into it as possible. And I do think, and, I, and and to his point as well, like I think um, I I do think about that a lot um, as well. But again, we all we all enjoy studying it, so I think we tend to overthink not overthink, but I think we tend to tend to think critically about all aspects of of game design um, that's uh, within within sort of an experience. But I actually do think like the attention to pieces is a really good way to sort of get an idea of how critically. Um, a designer has thought about the concepts that they're actually engaging with. So if it's designed poorly, that's usually an indication that there's like sort of a, a minimal degree of, of thought that has gone into sort of multiple other aspects. Because I think the attention to detail of the pieces of the artwork um, of the game board is, is incredibly important, especially for a lot of the really difficult topics um, that games can address. And so I think that's, that's sort of like a good shorthand, I feel, to get a sense of, of what it is a game is trying to do um, and versus what it what it's actually has has done. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Uh, the materiality and, and you know, of course, uh, taking in the the consideration of you know waste um, and you know games having giant lumps of minis, um, being you know thinking about the material 
cost of producing um, and economic impact um, and obviously climate impact on, uh, of these of the materiality as well. So, yeah. All right, here's a good question. I like these kinds of questions because they are great ways to kind of close out things. If we still have time, we can ask more questions. But Nick asks, uh, with the decolonization of games being difficult to achieve, uh, and maybe this is what everyone can say one thing that they would do. Uh, what would be a more responsible approach to game design? Reversing the narrative, such as with Spirit Island, exposing historical accuracy in colonialism, such as with games, uh, with games such as in Denver, or would it be best for designers to move away from colonization as a structure for games? How would you decolonize games <laughs> or com complicate our relationships to race in games? Yeah, I mean, that's the question, right? <laughs> um, I think that um, of those three, Nick, uh, I think that probably moving away from colonial themes and mechanics in games um, would probably be the most lucrative and sort of hold the most water. But as we've seen on this panel, it's that's a lot harder to do, you know, than we think. And I think that I think the first step of whatever it is that we do has to be recognizing that we're in colonial space no matter what we do, unless we destroy all of society, you know, which is, there are theories out there for that. But like, unless we do that, we're here in the Western world in colonial space, and we've got to start from there. Um, so in recognizing perhaps more of the complications and inherent uh, uh, kind of racism and violence in more benign seeming mechanics and trying to move away from explicit ones toward more intentionally uh, non-violent uh, ones, I think might be a way to do that. Yeah, I think at least for me, yeah, I guess the one thing I, I think acknowledging to Brandon's point, yeah, acknowledging the extent to which even despite your best efforts, you will you will sort of you'll still be complicit, because <laughs> we do exist within that broader discourse like there's no it's it's there's sort of a tendency sometimes I think with uh, especially a lot of games that sort of try to to do really positive things as like a people's technology unaffected by power relations and that can sort of even be further obscured depending on like the example of um, the 50th anniversary edition of blacks and whites which was donating a portion of proceeds to the National Black Urban League like or housing league and and like all of those things sort of are, are really great. We're very excited by it, but it's sort of, um, I think focusing on that ignores the ways in which we reinforce, like the games I talked about, uh, like trading races as an example, um, that even as we sort of try to deconstruct or uh, decolonize uh, games that we are still sort of reinforcing and upholding different elements of it. So I, I feel like, I feel like acknowledging that and I personally, I feel like I would try to critique it. I feel like critiquing it is just the, the best way or at least the, the clearest way for me personally um, to be able to address uh, colonization in games, like acknowledging the fact that we can't ever entirely move away from it, but that doesn't mean that we can't create a space with, through which we can critique it in such a way as to create new insight or sort of new understandings um, about what it is, like what it is that colonization does and also like how it is that we would sort of navigate within this space. Because I think games sort of really force that confrontation in a really interesting way. So I, I, yeah, the short answer is I think I would, I feel like I would try to critique it in a way that was very like, like essentially the setting of the game would be a critique of colonization. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think this, the especially in Euro games, you know, we get this conception of pasted on theme and something like that, you know, it's something like, like this game did not have to be in the setting. They was just uncritically put in this setting with no intentionality of critiquing these sort of colonial practices. Um, you know, it's going as far in, in Mombasa's case to just be like, oh, it's not even in Africa. Don't worry. It's in fictional Africa, <laughs> right? Like, um, it's fine, you know, but, um, you know, yeah. I, so I think um, if there can be some more intentionality um, and the critique in the way that we can read Monopoly or the Landlord's Game as a critique of capitalism, right? Something like that. Um, you know, I think that is better but i don't know again everything is we're all complicit so yeah. i think yeah the the three answers here as varied i think and well put as they all were like i think are absolutely true and then at the same time solely speaking for myself i think it's a difficult question to answer because like sometimes i feel as though i don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about play or when we're talking about games like 
to, to even address the question, I feel as though I don't always have the tools to actually address them themselves. Like um, when I'm playing with D&D &D with friends and like I talk about my interest in doing this stuff, right? And they're like, you know, perhaps they've been dealing with these issues in the real world all day and they come to the table and want to escape properly, right? And who am I to perhaps deny them the pleasure of indulging in a power fantasy, even if I think that power fantasy perpetuates a lot of harmful themes? I don't quite know where to begin with any of those issues, you know? Uh, critique is a good start, but hopefully not the finish. I would just build, I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of work in queer game studies, uh, primarily in video games, but um, moving to analog games too. But, you know, I think, you know, this is many pronged, right, and multi layered. And, I, you know, our complicity doesn't mean we stop trying, obviously. Um, and, uh, and then I do think, you know, recognizing that we also need to train players to expect different things or to want different things or to play differently or to think with these questions. And so maybe starting with something like blacks and whites, but then transitioning them immediately into something more difficult or challenging or or more nuanced, I think is is the is one trajectory to sort of think through. Um, or taking, I, I like that a lot of you are taking existing games and then repurposing them or doing something with them. Um, uh, and so that's that's all really you know wonderful and, and important things uh, as well. Well, we have about five minutes. Any last questions? Or Aaron, do you have any, do you want to do housekeep end of housekeeping things? You're muted. Yeah, I think I should do housekeeping. Okay. But I want to to stop the video. So let's Great. just pause for one second to see if there's a final question or anything that trickles up. Okay, I think I think we're good. I'm going to stop the video.